Hey people, it's Nayas Toki. Now this is another Black Holocaust video. Now this article is titled A Portrait of Cruelty, Madame Marie Delphine Lalori. A look about one of New Orleans New Orleans darkest residents. On April 10th, 1834, so the story goes, a fire broke out in a mansion in the old French quarter of New Orleans. According to one version of the tale, when the neighborhood poured out to rub a neck and offer help, they noticed something odd by 19th century southern elite standards. The one of the house was trying to save her jewels and furs without the aid of her slaves. When asked where her servants were, she told everyone to mind their own business. Some said this was mysterious enough. Others said they heard faint moans and screams from the attic. Anyway, a small brigade took it upon itself to bust into the house and find the woman's slaves. Yet when they opened the door to the attic, they stopped dead in the tracks, some vomiting from the stench. When the interlopers had found was the torture chamber of Madame Marie Delphine de Lalaurie, consistently ranked as one of the most infamous serial killers in the world, right up there with the blood-drinking cannibalistic 16th century Hungarian countess Elizabeth Baffery or Lizzie Borden and her alleged 40 wax. Renowned in New Orleans lore as the savage mistress, Lalaurie became fam famous for the depraved brutalization of her slaves. Legend has it that a 70-year-old slave cook who had been chained to the stove by Lalaurie yet was slowly starving to death, started the fire. But that was far from her most extreme torture. A brief catalogue of the ever-changing list of horrors people claimed the would-be rescue found her in her attic include heaps of corpses, organs, and limbs, slaves pinned to tables or cramped in small cages, live bodies with their eyes gouged, fingernails torn out, ears hanging by shreds of skin or their mouths filled with animal shit and sewn shut, people flayed of skin with festering wounds. Many accounts claim they found one woman whose skin had been peeled off in spirals to make her look like a caterpillar. Another with her bones broken reset so she looked like a crab, and and one more whose intestines had been torn out and knotted around the waist. Some many of these victims, some claim they were up to one hundred, were supposedly still alive, putrid and starving. Yet many believe rumors of the death Lalaurie wrought have been greatly exaggerated. I can't be honestly believe that they would be alive after that kind of treatment, especially about modern medical techniques. Let's keep going. Some historians eager to contradict portrayals of Lalaurie as inhuman have tried to fully exonerate her. Of course they would. But the truth lies somewhere in between the fiendish legend and the scenely expungings. Lalaurie was certainly a monster, but she was probably not insane or even incredibly unusual for her time. Like some Lovecraftian god, she is, she was and is terrifying because she is a living fossil. An unabashed emanation of a particularly barbaric uh, form of slavery that was briefly common in parts of Louisiana. No, it wasn't brief. I don't like the, they're trying to whitewash this. This is very common. It's just not talked about. Born in 1787 in then Spanish ruled New Orleans as Marie Delphine McCarty, most of LaLaurie's life passed away without any real indication of cruelty or evil. Despite false rumors that slaves killed their parents, the mistress actually lived a fairly normal and privileged life. She was a major part of New Orleans high society and beloved as a kind, gentle, and courteous figure, like all serial killers. Revisionists even point out that on these two occasions she had emancipated slaves. The latter, just two years before her torture chamber was discovered. This doesn't prove much. The first emancipation was in the will of her widow, and the second may just have been part of local social conventions dictating that older so slaves of good record should be freed. Some tried to explain that Lalaurie's descent into depravity by way of her third husband, Louis Lalaurie, who was not related to her before their marriage, a younger doctor freshly arrived from France. He knocked up the Richard Lalaurie, then married her after their child was born in 1826. Soon after their marriage began, stories of her abuse against her slaves started to emerge. Residents filed complaints leading to investigations for cruelty to slaves. New Orleans had unique laws theoretically protecting child slaves more than other parts of the Deep South. In 1828, 1829, 1832, some she began beating her daughters when they tried to feed them, although she put on a kind public face. Those inclined to absolve LaLaurie take this line of logic that the mistress was driven to insanity and violence by Louis to its extreme. They argued that Lalori, who some suspect was experimenting with Haitian voodoo potions to create more docile servants, turned away help from the fire as he was the one mutilating the Lalori slaves in cruel half-medical experiments. So they're trying to put it on the man and trying to make the white woman seem particularly innocent and pure. Mm, not like the media today, yet... Louis wasn't the only force that would have introduced the mistress to violence. Many suspect that Lalaurie was influenced by the 1771 murder of her uncle by slaves, violence of the 1791 to 1884 Haitian slave revolt <coughs> and independence movement, and the direct experience of a slave uprising in New Orleans in 1881, 1811. There of these events, the growing consensus among local slave owners to exercise increasing violence and oppression, often demonstrated in public and gruesome waves. 
to prevent recurrences in the aftermath likely had a strong impact on Lalori, who would have been exposed to chaos and anti-slave bloodshed regularly. The plantation owners, of which Lalori was one, were living in terror, explains Daniel Rasmussen, the author of American Uprising, History of the 1811 Slave Rebellion. They were terrified by Haiti. They had read the slave newspapers reports. Once a week or two, so there were stories about rapes, beheadings, brutality against whites in Haiti. And they think if they don't crack down and keep their slaves under control, what happened in Haiti will happen in New Orleans. The forms of punishment were quite extreme. Eighteen elephants revolt saw over a hundred slaves beheaded, their heads were put on poles stretching for 40 miles from the center of New Orleans out into the countryside. You see slaves' corpses from the rebellion dangling from the city gates. The growing sense of panic and need probably explains why none of the investigators called in to check on Lalaurie's cruelty or even charge of anything, until 1833 that is. That year, the mistress apparently grew enraged with a 12-year-old slave girl, Leah, who tugged at a snack, uh, snag while brushing the mistress's hair. She chased the young girl around with a whip, and the tween chose to jump off the roof and then face the flashing. Witnesses saw Lalaurie burying the girl's mangled corpse, so they were forced to fine her $300 and make her sell her nine slaves. But they looked the way as they did most slave cruelty cases when Lalaurie and her family members buy back her slaves, transfer them to her, and compensated them for their expenses. For all the anti-cruelty laws, a good de- degree of violence was tolerated for them. So nobody would record exactly what was going on in the Lurie household in the years before the fire, because it all probably se- just seemed like a standard post-1811 slave punishments. The mansion fire broke out in 1844. That episode is well documented in the newspapers today. Folks did get irate at her for not opening her attic to free her slaves, and what they found did shock them. But the original accounts are a far cry from crab women and intestine bells. They are still far from pretty exonerating stories. Slaves were found, chained, star- scarred, and starving. One paper noted that seven were suspended by their necks and badly mutilated, while another mentioned a man with a hole in his head filled with maggots. They had bloody welts, were living on gruel, and wore iron collars with inward facing spikes, which seemed like a tableau pulled from an arch- a medieval torture chamber. Yet, according to Rasmussen, they were fairly typical forms of constraint on the plantation that side of New Orleans, where rural landowners feared that their slaves would grab their field machetes at night and come for them in their sleep, so they exercised extreme brutality regularly. They would tie your hands to four stakes, then whip you with a cat of nine tails, and they would leave you bleeding and barely able to move, says Rasmussen. They also had iron masks to put around your head so you couldn't eat, and they had collars with spikes facing inward so the slaves couldn't sleep while getting spikes stuck in their necks. Those were common forms of punishment in Louisiana during this period. They believed that without the threat of tremendous violence, slaves wouldn't stay slaves. Normal or not, a mob of nearly 4,000 people still felt that this violence was egregious enough to ransack her house on the spot, looting and pillaging in disgusted rage as the fire burned. Rasmussen suspected that this time, over 20 years removed from the violence, she had grown up with and secure in, inside the safety and now established a well controlled New Orleans. People have started to lose their fear of slaves, distancing themselves from the harsh punishments of the countryside and coming closer to the genteel image of protective and soft slavery promoted in things like the local legal code under which LaLaurie had been investigated. Whatever the source of their shock, they seemed hell-bent on punishing her for her overzealous application or any extreme form of punishment. Yet in the fracas, she escaped with her slave driver Bastien to the docks where she fled to Paris. Some believe that she died there in 1842 or 1849 where she was disinterred and moved to a cemetery in New Orleans in 1851. Others believe she faked her death in Paris so that she could secretly return to Louisiana and keep on carrying out her cruel life secretly. Others believe she never really left. It's all a mystery. But many people don't really, didn't really care what had happened to LaLaurie. She was more useful as a legend than a clearly identified corpse. The story was picked up in papers in the north, catching eyes of outsiders like English writer Harriet Martineau, who traveled to New Orleans in 1836 to carry stories about the mistress in an attempt to explain her cruelty. It was this quest that yielded many of the post facto accounts of a foul temper, including the de- tale of the death of the 12 year old slave girl. And from there, people further elaborated and embellished the stories, creating a body of local law. By the end of the century, and strung out in even gory half truths by tour operators in the past century. Yet we do know a little about her life, later life, thanks to the correspondence kept by her children. The story they tell is a woman resettled in Paris and living a quiet, harmless life. She apparently never expressed more rage or violence, at least there's no record of it nor expressed nor understood why she had been driven out of New Orleans or realized the implications of her violence. But of course she didn't. She had no more slaves that she could take it out on. Some have taken this as a sign that Lalori was suffering from some sort of mental illness. Ah, the mental illness defense. Same with the mass shooters. But there was not a whole lot of actual proof that the mistress was insane, or even that she, uh, that she was that unusual given the context she grew up in. The really scary truth about the bloody Lalori is that she didn't understand that what she did was wrong, because for a while on the plantations of Louisiana, what she did was mundane and routine. She was a monster, but she was part of a race of monsters who justified their existence to themselves of a logical, violent response to disruption of the natural order of things. 
No, it wasn't natural. She was a demon, but not in the inhumane way some would have you believe. She was the most, she was the evil almost anyone can become, put into stark contrast and canonizes which, for openly displaying her tortures past their social and contextual expiration date. Well, there's loads of explaining and trying to make her seem human in here, but I hope you've enjoyed this. I'll put a few more sources in here. Please comment, rate, share, and subscribe if you'd like to support this channel. I'll leave my GoFundMe in the description. If you'd like to follow me on Instagram, I'll leave that there as well. Peace.